Hey, what's going on guys? Ben Brewster here at TrevX.com. Uh, today we're going to talk about lower half mechanics as it relates to hip structure and hip anatomy and why that's important and what you, what you can do to fix it. So first we're going to compare and contrast a, a couple of big league pitchers who both have touched 100 miles an hour and we're going to kind of look at both extremes on the spectrum uh, to see different types of hips, uh, how they manifest themselves in lower half pitching mechanics, uh, and then also how you can assess yourself, how you can assess your hip range of motion, uh, we're not going to get into kind of correctives for that, but just how you can assess it for now and some tips for actually uh, modifying or, or testing some things in your own delivery based upon what you find there. So uh, without further ado, let's dive into the video. So I really like this clip of, of Fulte, um, first because it's a first base view. So we have a really clear view of his pelvis, we have a really clear view of his weight shift, and we get a really clear view of exactly what his lead leg is doing as he moves his way down the mound. So there's, there's really a, a you know, clear view of how exactly he's initiating that forward shift and where his weight goes and what his hips are doing as he moves down the mound. So let's break this down. So I like that he's got a very simple delivery uh, just because it kind of helps isolate the essence of how he's able to produce velocity. When there's all sorts of you know, stylistic differences uh, or, or you know, crazy uh, kind of extraneous factors in a pitcher's delivery, it can kind of obscure what's actually going on. Like Tim Litzkam is one example. When there's so many moving parts, it can obscure what's really generating that velocity. With Fulte, it's so simple that it kind of gives you just the nuts and bolts of, of what matters. Um, now he's an example of a very external rotation dominant uh, set of lower half mechanics. So I'll explain what I mean by that. So here we have his initial set position. You can see his weight shift or his weight is distributed. Uh, something like 50-50, maybe even 60-40 towards his front foot. That's what we typically like to see to encourage a good weight shift, which you can see as he lifts his leg. His head doesn't shift way back here. He gets moving forward right away. At peak leg lift, his center of mass is out in front of the rubber. He's not stalled over the rubber. That's important. Also notice he doesn't have a huge coil, so he's not lifting that knee back here. He's lifting his knee relatively straight up. That's extremely important, which we'll get into in a second. Now this is, this is kind of the key as he moves down the mound. So as he comes out of that drift and he now drops into his hinge right here, he's dropping into that back loop. This is what separates him from someone like an internal rotation dominant pitcher. And what I mean by that is because of his hip structure, because of how his acetabulum, where his hip sockets are kind of oriented in his pelvis um, and, and the orientation of the femur, look how he's clearing this lead leg early. When I say clearing, he's already got that lead foot pointing relatively straight onto the target and he's got this this position almost like the knees are uh, in the, like a sumo deadlift position so his knees are flared kind of out he's in this externally rotated position now what you'll see is that guys who are AR dominant they're obviously a very good external rotation and so for him as he moves down the mound as we watch his pelvis there's not a ton of pelvic rotation happening right his belt buckle is facing third base this whole time there's really limited pelvic rotation happening from here all the way through right about here. So his linear move, he's riding this pelvis. You can think of the pelvis as kind of this, this bowl. He's riding this level bowl down the mound, down the slope, but he's doing so by holding that back leg in this more externally rotated position and by clearing this lead leg early. This is a pattern that we consistently see in our athletes who have ER dominant lower halves and who have very poor internal rotation when we actually assess them on a table. And that's because this is a position that maximizes uh, the, the stability and the, the room and the, the range of motion they have in the actual hip joint. So for them to keep the pelvis stable as they move down the mound and for them to have this, this linear move where they don't open the pelvis early and they're able to ride the stable pelvic position, the stable torso position, the question their body has to answer is, how are they gonna, how are they going to be able to do that? What position, in regards to kind of both both femur positions, what position is going to ma maximize the room that they have available to them in their body structure to move the pelvis down the mound and still have this ability to unwind tension just before landing? So right here, he's still holding the pelvis closed. He's cleared the front leg. And he's still holding contact with the back leg, and the pelvis releases. So again, in his case, because of the way his anatomy works, 
because of the way his range of motion, his hip rotation works. Clearing that lead leg is, is again what we commonly see. This is an athlete uh, we originally coached, now he's actually a coach for us. But again, very similar thing. So watch how he, again, shifts his weight similarly. And then as he gets into his lower half, watch how he keeps the pelvis relatively closed, but he's actually clearing the lead leg. So that lead leg clears, he's doing his best to hold this knee back while also clearing this lead leg. So it's a knee out position. Some coaches will refer to this as kind of an outside, uh, outside mover versus inside movers. So ER dominant guys are outside movers. And again, he's a guy with very poor internal rotation, very good external. So let's watch that again. He's got the drift with minimal coil. From there, he drops into his hinge. And then from there, he's got to answer the question, what is the most stable position for my pelvis to ride me forward down the mound with a closed pelvis and a stacked torso? And the answer for him, where does he have room in the hip joint? It's in this more knee out position. And so he clears that front foot, that front hip without opening the pelvis. The pelvis stays closed. He's just externally rotating this femur. So he's clearing the front leg, not opening the pelvis, and he's holding this knee back. That knee is not gonna necessarily stay perfectly vertical. Perfectly vertical shin typically means that the pitcher's head is still all the way back here and they didn't shift their weight particularly well, but there's an attempt to keep that knee back. So again, just another example of this. In practice, again, he's been up to, uh, into the upper 90s. Uh, Justin Verlander, I like to use him all the time as an as a ER dominant pitcher. But again, you'll see relatively minimal coil during his leg lift, maybe five, 10 degrees of coil. Drops into the hinge, as soon as he drops into the hinge, he clears that lead foot early, that lead leg. This is in relative external rotation. The belt buckle is still facing third base. He's trying to hold this knee back. So it's again, knee out position, hip snap open just before landing. And that allows him to have an effective finish the throw, effective lead leg block, etc. So let's compare and contrast that to someone like a Hunter Harvey, who uh, he's with the Orioles right now, up to hundred miles an hour. Let's look how he moves. So how is he riding that pelvis? How, what is he doing uh, to find that stable pelvic position and ride it forward and close down the mound while keeping this trunk stack? How does he do it? Well, he's doing more of an inside mover position. So this is an IR dominant lower half. Specifically, we call this a femur driven IR dominant lower half. But you can see this is much more of like a knee to knee position. And this happens because of actually how the hip anatomy is structured. So where the acetabulum, where the hip socket is positioned relative to the pelvis, in the pelvis, um, and also the, the angle of the femur in the acetabulum. And so where does he have range of motion and room in his hip, in his hip socket? Well, in this internally rotated position. And so that's the position for him that's most advantageous. And so for him, it's not clearing the lead leg. In fact, if you had him clear that lead leg and externally rotate it early, I can guarantee you he would lose velocity. And so for him, the position that's the most stable is to actually ride this position forward, holding internal rotation tension and internal rotation torque. And so that's the position for him that allows him to, just before landing, he's still got the pelvis closed, he's still got the trunk stacked. Just like Fulte, right here, just before landing, he's got the pelvis closed, trunk stacked. It's just how they get there is different. Knee out, clear the lead leg early, knees in, hold that lead leg closed as long as possible. But again, it's accomplishing the same things. It's just about matching the orientation of the lead leg and the back leg to your hip anatomy and, and the available range of motion that you actually have. So a coach who says everyone has to be vertical shin and you know hold the lead leg closed, right? That doesn't really make a lot of sense for certain athletes because they don't have the structure to do that effectively. Now, for me personally, I fall into the kind of Hunter Harvey camp. This is how my hips work. Uh, it's thought that this is related to what's called hip antiversion. Um, so the, the bony structure is more of a uh, anteriorly or oriented position. 
uh, with the acetabulum and the femoral angle. Um, so for me, this is the position that elicits the best results. Um, you know, minimal uh, pinch in my hip, maximum velocity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If I try to throw this way, velocity decreases, doesn't feel comfortable, and then you will know, kind of feel like there's a tugging on my on my hip. So again, that's just a brief overview of the differences between guys who are really ER dominant and guys who are really IR dominant. Okay, so that's kind of what's going on here, different anatomy, but how do you actually test this in yourself? So there are some clinical tests that can kind of identify what's actually going on from a structural standpoint, but in most cases, and from our experience, again, we've assessed thousands of pictures, it doesn't have to be that complicated to get a general idea of what's going on. We use a prone hip rotation test to quickly, at a glance, identify if there's a strong bias in one direction or another towards internal rotation, hip external rotation, or really no bias towards either direction. Some athletes have good range in both directions. So all you're gonna do is you're gonna lay on your stomach, you're gonna set up a video camera behind you so that you can see the angle of hip rotation. You're gonna bend both legs to 90 degrees and you're gonna let your feet fall out to the side. This tests hip internal rotation. Next, you're gonna let one leg extend straight and you're gonna let the other leg fall in the opposite direction. As you do that, stabilize your pelvis with both hands to make sure that you're not cheating the range of motion from your pelvis and that you're actually getting that hip external rotation from your hip itself. Once you test one leg, extend that leg, flex the other, and allow that leg to fall into external rotation. From here, there's a number of different apps that can allow you to actually measure that angle from your computer, from your phone, or you can actually just take an old fashioned angle measure and measure that angle. What we find is that athletes who have less than 25 degrees of hip internal rotation and more than about 45 degrees of hip external rotation in this position are typically our retroverted guys. These are our guys who have very, very good hip ER, poor IR, and they're likely going to do better throwing in more of these uh, kind of faulty Verlander-esque postures with this knee out position. Vice versa, what we see is that pitchers like myself with equal to or greater than about 45 degrees of internal rotation and less than about 25 degrees of hip external rotation fall into that more anti-verted category and they're going to do better typically with more of that uh, back toe in knee to knee position a little bit more coil uh, as kind of their their posture and their style as they move forward down the mountain it's typically going to elicit better results now again this is all on a spectrum these are guys at kind of both extremes there are a significant number of pitchers who are just slightly in favor of external, slightly in favor of internal, and fall somewhere in between. And so a lot of pitchers will find when you do this test that you're about 25 to 35 degrees, both in ER and in IR. And for you guys, I'm sorry, it's not necessarily a super clear path. Um, it really comes down to trial and error and, and establishing um, you know, which set of mechanics elicit the best results for you. And you might do better with a little bit of coil. You might do better more of a toe out position. You might do better a little bit of toe in position. Uh, we definitely have plenty of athletes who, who fall in that category. And it becomes a little bit more of a tinkering, uh, an experimental process to figure out what works best for them. The biggest lesson here is that if you are an ER dominant guy, don't put your body at a disadvantage. Don't try to throw like an IR guy. You can make it work, but it's going to limit your efficiency. It's going to limit your efficiency to actually ride that pelvis down the mound and maximally transfer that energy into rotation. So we'll typically see roughly a two to four mile an hour swing. If there's a guy who's been throwing with the wrong type of mechanics for his hip structure and we fix that, typically that accounts for about two to four miles an hour and it feels significantly more comfortable for the athlete. Vice versa, if you're an IR dominant guy, and you've been trying to throw like an ER dominant guy, again, we see about two to four miles an hour uh, from fixing that issue. Finally, just to summarize some general tips that you can kind of take away from this. If you have identified that you're a retroverted slash ER dominant guy, some things to try. One is to turn the foot out. Turn the back foot about 15 degrees out towards second base. It's not gonna be fully facing second base, but turn it out slightly, this is gonna actually give you a little bit more room uh, in your lower half move and your linear move towards the plate. So give that a try. That's something that, again, you can just take one bullpen to test that out and see if there's a positive change. A lot of times we will see a positive change there for ER dominant guys. Second is the knee out position that we already talked about with, with Fulte is making sure to clear that lead leg early without opening the pelvis and hold that back knee 
back towards second base, again, to maximize the room in your hip and maximize that position. Uh, the next thing is to minimize coil during your leg lift. Typically, a major coil is, again, it's going to drive that pelvis into IR over the back hip. And again, that's just going against the natural hip structure that you've got. So a t uh, test out minimal coil during the leg lift that can also make it easier to actually get that lead leg to clear early because your leg doesn't have to travel so far out and around. And then finally, striding and landing on target. Striding cross body and landing with a slightly closed front foot, we found that to really not work well for ER dominant guys. So you can think about this as staying behind the lead leg, striding on target, and then landing on target as well. So guys that stride cross body and land with a closed front foot really doesn't work for ER dominant guys. They don't have the rotation and the room in this front hip to effectively block the lead leg from that position. So again, just some general tips for guys with retroverted hips. For guys with antiverted hips, it's mostly the opposite of that. So antiverted hips, you can experiment with a toe in position for the back foot. Again, very slight, maybe 10 to 15 degrees. This can take out some of the slack in the back hip and avoid you having to uh, coil so extremely against that back leg, uh, especially for guys that have 45, 55, 60 degrees of, of IR. They're gonna have a lot of room in that back hip. So turning that back foot in slightly can actually take out some of the slack and give you a more stable uh, stable feeling, something to kind of wind against and hold as you move towards the target. So turning that back foot in, that's something to play with. Uh, the knee in position, as Hunter Harvey shows right here, that knee to knee position. Another way of thinking about this is the lead foot showing the heel or showing the, showing the cleats to the target. It's another way to think about holding the pelvis closed in, in that kind of knee to knee position. Again, that's a cue that really only works for IR dominant guys who have the range and have the ability to do that. Okay, we talked about uh, less coil for ER dominant guys. Uh, more coil can work, it's not entirely necessary, but you can see how Hunter Harvey does get a little bit more coil in someone like Fulte. Again, I have seen it work where, where guys can lift that knee straight towards second base and they can get away with it because they're an IR dominant guy. So experimenting with a little bit of coil during your leg lift can be really helpful for antiverted guys. And then the final thing is don't be afraid if you happen to already naturally be a cross body guy and it works for you. We've seen plenty of IR dominant guys make that work. So that's the first thing. It's not, it still can be considered uh, an inefficiency to stride super cross body as an IR dominant guy. But if that's your thing, that gives you deception. You're still able to throw hard. You're still able to stay healthy. You're still able to block the lead leg and it works for you. It's not something that I would automatically change. We have seen that work in some of our very hard throwing professional guys. And again, I would not consider that an issue in every single case. And then to go along with that, the angle of the lead foot. So how the lead foot lands relative to the target, does it land straight on or slightly closed? Actually, we find that landing slightly closed, 10, 15 or 20 degrees on the lead foot, uh, tends to be the optimal position for IR dominant guys. And again, it may have to do with taking out some of the slack in that lead hip so that at ball release, when they actually get to ball release, the pelvis is square to the target. And if they landed more uh, more straight on target with the, with the lead foot, the pelvis ends up continuing to rotate and over rotating and pointing somewhere over there versus pointing straight at the target. But so landing a little bit close with the front foot, not freaking out if you stride a little cross body, but make it work. Experimenting with some coil during your leg lift can work knee to knee position and back foot in if you test as having really good IR. So I threw a lot at you guys. You may not have necessarily found anything helpful from that if you're a guy who has kind of average hips with decent range in both directions. But if you found if you fell on either end of the extremes here, hopefully that gave you something to think about, a different lens to assess your mechanics through and some things to test, some things to try. And if you're a coach, hopefully this, again, gave you a different perspective uh, through which to examine your athletes. And again, hip rotation is just one small component of an effective assessment and one small piece of how you how to actually understand uh, high level throwing mechanics. So you need to be able to understand how we broke this down in, in this video and, and the connection between your hip structure and mechanics. How do we understand the difference in, in different foot structures? Tibial rotation, uh, hip flexion extension, how does that influence things? Pelvic posture and pelvic positioning. Uh, torso positioning, T-spine rotation, shoulder flexion, extension, 
uh, internal external rotation, cervical rotation, cervical flexor and extension. There's all sorts of different nuances going on that if you as a coach can understand and you can tie that back into how an athlete moves. Now you have a ton of tools at your disposal because now we can address some of these things in the weight room from a corrective standpoint and from a mechanical standpoint and match the mechanics to what the athlete's body can actually do. It gives an extremely powerful uh, paradigm for being able to positively influence how athletes actually move on the mound. And it gives us more guidance in terms of how we design and construct actual training corrective programs. I know it's a little bit complex, um, but again, we have to get into the weeds at some point. That being said, if you aren't already subscribed to the channel, go ahead and subscribe, click the thumbs up. If you guys do not already follow us on Twitter, go ahead and follow us at Tread Athletics. We also post daily on Instagram at Tread underscore athletics. And if you have any questions specific to your own coaching career or your own playing career, we work with athletes at all levels. We work with dozens of MLB pitchers, hundreds of minor league pitchers, and thousands of high school and college pitchers. So go ahead and reach out to us at contact at treadathletics.com. If you have any questions related to your specific career, let us know what you're struggling with. We read and respond to every single email. We hop on a call if you have any questions or concerns, and we look forward to seeing you guys in the next video.